Hello folks. Today we're going to talk about different kinds of diodes. We've already talked about rectifying diodes and signal diodes, our sort of basic diodes, but there are other kinds of diodes. So we're going to look at, among other things, Zener diodes. LEDs, photodiodes as well, varactors, and the Schottky diode. Matter of fact, let's start with that Schottky diode. It's the sort of more straightforward of the group here. Uh, first, the symbol. It's a regular diode with little jazz hands. Now the thing about the Schottky diode is the forward potential is smaller than typical for a silicon diode, you know, which would be around uh, 0.7 volts. So a Schottky, the forward potential is maybe a few hundred millivolts. All right, I'll just say 200, you know, it might be a little more, a little less. So very small barrier potential. The other thing is, High speed, very fast, good switching. So a classic application for a Schottky diode would be something like a switching power supply. And that's something that we will look at in the op amps sequence. For now, all you really need to know is it's a fast diode and the barrier potential is uh, smaller than typical. Okay, so that's our Schottky. Now, Varactor. The heck is a Varactor diode? Varactor is basically a variable capacitor. It's a, you can think of it as a voltage-controlled capacitor. Now, your normal uh, diode, right? you would have P and N material, and there's a depletion region. Well, you can think of that depletion region as uh, like the dielectric of a capacitor. And what we remember about a capacitor is that capacitance is equal to the permittivity times the plate area divided by the plate spacing distance. So what happens is when we reverse bias a diode, this is true for all diodes, that depletion region widens and the capacitance of that junction changes. It actually decreases a little bit. Reactors are designed to sort of exacerbate that quality. So it has a uh, symbol that's kind of a combination of a capacitor and a diode. It looks like that. If you put this in reverse bias, so they're going to be used in reverse bias, and you change the voltage, you will see a change in the capacitance. And that change will look something like this. And so if this is the reverse diode voltage and this is the capacitance on the junction, you get something like that. It's not a straight line, it's a curve. It's not a linear function. So you might find that a, a, a tenfold change in, in the reverse bias voltage might give you a, a three to four change in capacitance. And the values for these are small. We're usually talking picofarads. So you might find a varactor that you know, goes from, say, 10 picofarads to 50 picofarads, or you know, uh, 75 picofarads to 200 picofarads, something like that. You're not going to find microfarads for these things. All right. Okay, next on the hit parade, LEDs, light emitting diodes. So the symbol for an LED, everybody's familiar with LEDs. It's just a diode symbol with a couple arrows coming out of it to indicate the light. Now, the things to remember about an LED are that brightness is proportional to the diode current. The more current you get, the brighter the LED is, okay? So there are a lot of applications we want constant brightness, so that means we want constant current. The other thing to remember is that the forward diode drop is not 0.7 volts. That will depend on the material used, which of course will indicate what the color is, you know, red, yellow, green, blue, and whether or not this is a sort of a typical LED or a high brightness LED. So, you know, maybe a, a jumbo red LED, the forward potential might be 1.8 volts instead of 0.7. Um, 
maybe a high powered blue might be three volts. You know, it all depends on that manufacturer. So that's the important thing to remember. Um, that that forward potential is going to be larger than expected for a simple rectifying diode. Um, if you have a typical jumbo LED, you know, round LED, uh, the shape of it, if you look clear, carefully at it, actually has a flattened side. So your two leads would come out like this, and you have the flattened side. Well, that flat side corresponds to the bar, to the cathode, right? So that's how you know which way to put them in to a circuit, all right? So the color and the material uh, indicates what that forward potential is, right? So VLED, not 0.7. Typical LED, you know, like a jumbo LED you might use in lab uh, to get reasonable brightness, you're probably going to need 10, 15, 20 milliamps. Now, the twin of this is the photodiode. So a photodiode is sort of the um, flip, however you want to look at that. Arrows go in. And essentially what happens is light strikes the photodiode and it produces a current. The more light there is, the uh, more current you get. Photodiodes uh, can be designed to look at the, the visible spectrum or the infrared spectrum. That's very common, right? You get an IR infrared photodiode and LED pair. And a good example of that is a remote, right? So this guy, there is the uh, photo LED, right? The LED, this is an IR LED. And then on your TV, you would have a photodiode or more likely a phototransistor, which is essentially the same idea. It's just more, uh, it's more sensitive. But essentially, you, you press a button on here, you say, you know, give me the volume. And a series of pulses drive the IR LED. Those are picked up by the photodiode or phototransistor and turned back into normal electrical signals. And you know, that's decoded in, inside the processor and, you know, the volume goes up or the channel changes or um, you instigate, uh, you know, self-destruct mode or, you know, whatever the heck it is, right? But solving these circuits is, is fairly straightforward. You know, if you have an LED, for example, you, you would solve it like, um, you know, the, the, the typical rectifying kind of signal diode sorts of examples. So if I had a, like a five volt DC power supply and Maybe I have 150 ohms over here. And here's my LED. And maybe the forward drop on this um, for the brightness that I'm looking for, let's say VLED is uh, two volts. So I want to find out, hey, what's, you know, what's the circulating current here? Well, you know, if that was a normal diode, you'd just say, okay, it's forward biased. But instead of saying it's 0.7, you'd say it's two. So if there's two volts out here, then there must be three volts across the resistor for KVL, which means that the diode current would have to be five volts minus two volts over 150 ohms, right? So that's three volts over 150 ohms, which is 20 milliamps. All right, so instead of the, you know, rectifying diode getting warm, most of that energy turns into, instead of infrared heat energy, it turns into, you know, visible light. So basically, as the electrons are, are moving an energy level, they're emitting photons at, uh, you know, red or yellow or, you know, whatever the wavelength is that that LED was designed for. Okay. All right. Um, Zener. All right. So the Zener, interesting little device. Uh, like the Veractor, we actually use this thing in reverse bias. The symbol for our Zener is also a very happy symbol, right? He's kind of waving. Not full jazz hands, but, you know, he's waving. So we use this in reverse bias. It's, you can imagine it's kind of like purposely putting this thing into breakdown in a way. Um, if you use a Zener in forward bias, it works like a regular diode. Alright, so here's your plus V and minus V across the uh, diode. So forward, you know, you get your typical 0.7. Reverse, I can't do this to scale, so I'm going to put a little break in here. Reverse, 
well, you know, we get this kind of breakdown thing, but it's designed specifically for this. This is your zener potential. So you would buy a zener at um, certain standard values, like you'd buy a 5.1 volt zener or 3.3, you know, so on and so forth. And there will be a value, IZT, the zener test current, right, above which you could assume this thing is, you know, pretty much straight up and down, better than I've drawn it where you get that particular value, you know, that 5.1 or 3.3 or, you know, whatever it is, right? So as an example, to use this, I'm gonna stick with the little single resistor kind of thing over here, just to keep it straightforward. So let's say we have 10 volts and uh, maybe a 1K resistor, and I'm gonna put in, uh, well, I mentioned, 5.1, so let's use a 5.1 for that. Now, normally, you know, if this was a normal diode, you would just say, well, this is reverse biased. It's an open, there's no current, all 10 volts drops across, you know, the, the rectifying diode. But as a zener, as long as this potential is bigger than the zener potential, the zener locks in. So what we would see here is 5.1 volts, which means the rest of the voltage would have to be dropping across this guy, 4.9 volts. So your current would be 4.9 volts divided by 1K or 4.9 milliamps, right? Now, as long as that's above IZT, everything's great, you know? If it's not and you're back here, you know, on the, on the curve, uh, you're probably not gonna get 5.1, you know, maybe get five, 4.93, you know, whatever. All right, what if you flip the diode? What if you put the diode in uh, this way? I want, I want to re redraw the whole thing. Right. So just put that on. Well, now it just behaves like a normal forward bias diode. So you'd have 0.7 volts, which means you'd have 9.3 over there, and your current would be 9.3 over 1K, or 9.3 mils. Right. So we always use zeners in reverse bias. Now, what if we have a somewhat more complicated circuit? I'll stick with my 10 volts and I'll stick with that 1K, but I'll throw in a resistor in parallel. Typically we would use a Zener as a voltage reference, or we might use it as part of a regulating circuit, power supply regulator. So what I'm gonna do here is, a, let's use a 3.3 volt zener, and uh, I'm gonna throw a 3K out here. Now the way I would like to uh, attack this problem is, um, first I kind of look and see, well, if the zener wasn't there, what would I get right? with no zener? Uh, well, if there was no zener, you would just have a voltage divider, right? So I'm interested in the voltage across this 3K. So it would just be a voltage divider, 10 volts times 3K over 4K. And we get seven and a half volts. Now, because the zener is less than seven and a half volts, that's going to lock in the potential for us so that we should get 3.3 volts. Now here's the deal. That's 3.3, these two are in parallel. So there must also be 3.3 across the 3K. So, that would allow us to find the current. All right, so the current through the 3K would be 3.3 volts divided by 3K. and that's going to uh, work out to 1.1 milliamps. Now, at the same time, if that's 3.3 and the source is 10, the remainder of that voltage must be dropping across the 1K, right? So this is gonna be 10 minus the 3.3. That's gonna be 6.7 volts. So the source current over here back from our 10 volt source is gonna be 6.7 volts 
divided by 1K or 6.7 milliamps. Now remember Kirchhoff's current law. That's what's coming in. Those are the two currents exiting. So there's 1.1 going this way, 6.7 coming in. It must be the case that the Zener is getting the difference. It's absorbing the difference. 6.7 minus 1.1. In other words, 5.6 mils. And this is where the regulation comes into play. So now we turn around and we change the 3K, right? So you change the 3K to a 2K. Now what happens? Well, you know, if I did it without the Zener, it would be 2K over 3K, two thirds of 10 volts at 6.67, basically. The Zener is still gonna be active. It's always gonna be the case that you're gonna have the 6.7 volts across this. So you're always gonna have the 6.7 mils, as long as the Zener is in conduction. Well, what happens to our uh, load current, our 2K current, all right? So the current through the 2K is just gonna be 3.3 .3 volts, because again, it's in parallel over 2K. So that's going to uh, work out to uh, 1.65 mils. Well, you still have the 6.7. So the Zener current is going to be the difference. All right, in other words, uh, 6.7 minus 1.65, which is 5.05. Well, what if we change it again? Uh, what if I go from uh, the three to the two to maybe 500 ohms? All right, well, 1K, 500, this should get a third if there was no Zener, that's 3.333333, uh, which is just a smidge more than this. So Zener's still gonna be on, and um, the current through the 500, squeeze this down here in the corner, it's gonna be 3.3 .3 volts over 500 ohms, and that's gonna get a 6.6 .6 mils which means that the current through the Zener is now just a tenth of a mil. So it's keeping this voltage constant and the Zener is sort of absorbing the difference between whatever the input is and this. Now, if we went further, like if we dropped it to say 200 ohms, Well, you're going to lose Zener conduction, All right? If if um, if the Zener wasn't here and you just did you know 200 over 1200, then you, you know you're you're only going to get a, a, a sixth of the input, right? 10 volts times 200 over 1200 is 1.67 volts. So you've lost Zener, right? That's less than the Zener potential. So burp, the Zener isn't there anymore. You lost this regulation ability. But that's essentially how it works. Right. So that's a, a simple way. It's not the most efficient way, but it's a simple way of creating a voltage regulator. And that's something we're going to look at uh, again when we look at um, AC to DC conversion right, with uh, full wave bridge rectifiers and things like that. Upcoming.